Hello and welcome back to another full step-by-step -step PC build guide and today I'm going to be showing you how to build a PC in Cooter Master's new NR200P Max. I think this is probably going to be the easiest mini ITX build guide I've ever done. So what's new with the NR200P Max? And if you just look at it from the outside on first glances, you'll be forgiven for thinking it's the same case. If you look closely, you'll notice the color is slightly different. We've got a gray color here, whereas the original NR200P was more of a black color. Um, if you go to the back of the case, you'll notice that there's only vertical GPU mounting options. So you can't mount your GPU horizontally like you could in the original NR200P. Taking out the side panels, we have still got the vented side panels on both sides of the case. And as well, because this is the P version, it comes with the optional temper glass panel you can change out. It's only when you open up the case that you spot the main differences, and they are that you've got a 280mm AIO pre-installed at the top of the case, as well as an 850 watt gold fully modular SFX power supply pre-installed. So as well as having some of your hardware pre-installed for you, it's also a new thing to be able to have a radiator at the top of this case. With the original NR200P, you could either have your radiator on the side or at the bottom, but having it at the top is completely new for the NR200P Max. So I'll be really interested in seeing how that affects the thermal performance. Another new thing for the NR200P Max is that the riser cable included is now Gen 4. And this is a good thing because you're gonna to have to mount your GPU in the vertical orientation. There is no option to mount it horizontally. So well done to Cooler Master for including a Gen 4 GPU riser cable. So putting all that together, the Cooler Master NR200P Max has two main advantages for me. The first is that you're getting your AIO installed in a much more sensible location with the radiator at the top of the case. And the other is that Cooler Master have really simplified the building process by pre-installing some of the components for you. And when you first look at the price of this case at just over 300 pounds in the UK, you might think this is a credibly expensive case. But when you look at what this includes, it includes the case, you're getting a 280 millimeter AIO, an 80 plus gold SFX power supply, and a Gen 4 riser cable. At that price, you're getting some incredibly good value for money. But does it make the build process any easier having everything pre-installed? That's something I'm gonna be testing out today. The other thing I'm gonna test out is the thermals. Is this better than the original NR200P? So make sure you stick to the end of the video to find out. So taking a look at the other components I've chosen for today's build, for the motherboard, I've gone with MSI B550i Gaming Edge Wi-Fi. For the CPU, I'm using AMD's Ryzen 7 3700X. And I know what some of you are thinking, it's almost the end of 2021, what are you doing with the 3700X? Um, two things, one, this is still a pretty good CPU, but importantly, this is the CPU I used in my original NR200P build. So I'm really interested in comparing the thermals with this case with the new radiator location compared to the original NR200P. So that's the reason for using this particular CPU. For RAM, I've got 16 gigabytes of good RAM's IRDM Pro at 3600 megahertz. For storage, I'm going with a single Gen 4 M.2 SSD from Sabrent. It's their Rocket 4 Plus in two terabyte capacity. The NR200P Max will accommodate large graphics cards up to a maximum length of 336 millimeters. So I'm gonna be pushing that to the limits with the ROG Strix RTX 3080. At the bottom of the case, we do have two optional fan mounting locations and I am planning to occupy these today to test the case's maximum cooling performance. It is however important to mention that standard thickness fans won't fit at the bottom. Standard thickness fans are 25 millimeters thick and you're gonna to have to use fans that are 15 millimeters thick. So I've got two of Noctia Chromax's thin fans. Um, and again, stick to the end of the video to find out, do these fans actually make any difference to the thermals? The final part for today's build is a double fan splitter cable. And the reason we're gonna to have to use this is we don't have enough fan headers on our motherboard to plug both of our fans in down at the bottom. And this is a fairly common problem with mini ITX motherboards. First thing I like to do in any build is prepare the case. As we go, I'll point out the case's main features. To remove the side panel, all we need to do is put it forward and away. Taking a look at the side panel we have just removed, you'll notice there is a removable magnetic mesh filter on the back of it. 
The other important thing to point out is the case does come with an optional tempered glass panel which you can replace with the one we've just removed. I'll get this out of the box and give you a look at it. So this is just going to slot in exactly the same way, slide it in at the front and push into place. So you can give your case the tempered glass look. Importantly, I am going to be showing you what this build looks like at the end, both with the tempered glass panel and the mesh panel at the front, and again testing the thermals of both. So I'm going to go ahead and remove this panel again. Our other side panel is removed in exactly the same way, just put it off from the side and take it away. Again, we've got a magnetic dust filter on the back of this panel as well. The case comes with a large accessory box and plenty of padding, so we'll go ahead and get them removed. So, taking a closer look at the case, we can see we've got our 280mm radiator and fans pre-installed at the top. We've got some extra long tubes. Uh, this is the water block and you can see Cooler Master have got it aligned absolutely perfectly for us in terms of length. We've got our SFX power supply all pre-installed with all the cables managed here. And what you can notice, the cable providing additional power to the CPU is routed all the way along to the top of where it's going to plug in on the motherboard. To remove the front panel, all you need to do is pull it forward and it should simply pull away. For our particular build, we don't need to remove the front panel. The only reason you're going to need to do it is if you want to install SATA SSDs because we've got two mounting locations, one here and one here. And you've got these rubber mounts here. You screw little pegs into the back of your SSD and they simply slot in here. The other place you can either install a 2.5 inch or 3.5 inch drive is on the power supply cage. And you can fit a further 3.5 inch drive down at the bottom. But again, importantly, if you are going to do this, remember it's going to take away one of your fan mounting locations down at the bottom. Taking a look at the front I.O., you can see we've got a power and reset button, we've got two USB Type-A connectors, and we've got a combined headphone and microphone jack. Again, for this particular build, we've got no reason to remove the top panel, but I'll show you how to do it. All you want to do is push up, and the top panel will simply lift off. As you can see from the rear panel design, you're only going to be able to point your graphics card in a vertical orientation in this case. It's good to see we've got three slots. Um, how you actually mount your graphics card is you remove this rear panel, mount your graphics card to the panel, and then slide the panel back in and screw it in. This panel is held on with two screws here and two screws here, so we'll go ahead and get it removed. With the four screws removed, we can simply pull this panel backwards and away. The other panel that we can remove to make the building process a little bit easier is the bottom panel. It's held on with one screw at the back. With the screw removed, we can simply lift the case up and lever it away from the bottom panel. Taking a look at the bottom panel that we've just removed, you can see we've got some cutouts for securing a 3.5 inch drive to the bottom. And again, we've also got a magnetic dust filter, which is removable. Now I want to show you what's contained in this accessory box. So this is everything that's contained in the accessory box. We've got two bags. The first one contains everything you're going to need to mount your cooler. We've got thermal paste, back plates, and brackets. And importantly, it does include the bracket for Intel's new LGI 1700 socket. Our second bag contains things like cable ties, additional mounts for SSDs and hard drives, and all the tools you're going to need to mount those. We've got our Gen 4 riser cable. And one of the things I'm noting is just how stiff and rigid this is, and well done to Killer Master for including a Gen 4 version. We've got some additional SATA and Molex power supply cables, and then we've got our wall power supply. Okay, we're now ready to start working on the motherboard. First thing to do is open this clip to allow us to install our CPU. If we take a look at this top left-hand corner, we've got a little white mark on the motherboard, and we're going to need to line this up with a mark on our CPU. Taking a look at our CPU, you'll notice the bottom left-hand corner has a little gold mark on it. If I turn it over, there's an even larger gold triangle on the bottom side. So this is the side that we're going to need to line up with the mark on the motherboard. Okay, so I'm going to hover our CPU over the socket and just let it fall into place. It hasn't fallen in yet, so I'm just going to move it about gently. And there we go, it's fallen into place. And then just going to go ahead and close the lever. Next, we need to install our M.2 SSD. The socket's behind this heatsink. It's held on with two screws. We should now just be able to lift the heatsink over to the side. Importantly, it has connected to the motherboard with a wire, so we just need to be careful with that. There we go. We're just going to rest it over to the side. To install our M.2 SSD, we just need to insert it at a slight angle into the socket. We can then go ahead and flatten it down and then secure it into place using a screw from the motherboard box. 
Then it's just a matter of replacing our heatsink. To install the RAM, the first thing we need to do is open the clips on both RAM slots. Then we need to go and line our RAM up with the slot, making sure we've got it installed the right way round. Once we're happy everything's lined up, it's just some firm pressure to the top of the RAM, and it will clip into place and the clip will close. And then the same thing with the other stick. We are now ready to go ahead and install our motherboard in the case. We've got four standoffs at the back of the case that we're going to need to line it up with. So I'm just going to go ahead and slide the motherboard in from the side, lining it up with the cutout at the back. And then we can go ahead and secure the motherboard into place using four screws from the accessory box. Okay, next thing to do is get our cables plugged in and Cutter Master have bundled most of the cables here at the bottom of the power supply. We've got two Velcro straps which is holding them in place. Um, you'll see the advantage of removing the bottom panel because we have much easier access for the build. So we've got a mixture of cables here. We've got power supply cables which we'll come on to in a minute and we've got three case cables. We've got our USB 3.0 cable, which is gonna let the two Type-A ports in the front of the case work. We've got our HD audio cable, which will let the headphone and microphone jack in the front of the case work. And we've also got our front panel connectors, things for power switch and reset. So we'll get these plugged in first of all. So first of all, our USB 3.0 cable is gonna go in this header here. We'll go ahead and line it up and push into place. Next, we've got our HD audio cable, and it's going to go into this header down the bottom left-hand side of the motherboard with the HD audio text facing up the way. So we'll go ahead and line it up and push into place. Next to that, we've got the header for our front panel connectors. We're going to want to plug it in with the power switch and power LED facing up the way because they go into the top row. Line it up and push into place. We're now ready to plug our power supply cables in, and the first cable I want to plug in is our 8-pin EPS cable, providing additional power to the CPU, which is up the top left-hand side of the motherboard. Now, one of the nice things, Cooler Master have already pre-routed this cable all the way to the top for us. So we pull it out at the top, we've got two 4-pin connectors, which are gonna plug into this header. Unfortunately, there's no way for me to get a great angle for this with the IIO pre-installed in the motherboard here. So we're just gonna go ahead and plug it in. The cable is already split into two four pin connectors, so it's just a matter of joining them together and getting them plugged in. Okay, next cable to plug in is our 24 pin power supply connector. So again, I'm just gonna line it up with the header and push into place. Just take a look at the cables that we have left. So we have two eight plus eight pin PCIe cables. Our graphics card is going to take three of these. And we've also got a SATA cable plugged in. We're not actually going to need SATA power for our build, so I'm just going to go ahead and unplug this cable. Next thing to do is go ahead and install the appropriate brackets for our CPU cooler. We've got an AM4 socket, so we're going to use these particular brackets here. So we just need to line them up with the cooler. And then we're going to screw in from the top. It's also important at this stage we go ahead and remove the plastic protection. Next we can go ahead and add a pea-sized amount of thermal paste to the center of the CPU. Then we can go ahead and line up our CPU cooler. What we're looking to do is get these metal clips over the clips on the motherboard. So we'll go ahead and get the top one on first of all. That's the top one clipped in. And then we'll go ahead and get the bottom one on. And again, that's the bottom one clipped in. Then all I'm going to do is tighten up the thumb screws. We're now going to need to go ahead and plug this cable coming from our pump. Our pump fan header and our CPU fan header are both here above our 24 pin connector. The one closest to the outside of the motherboard is for the pump header. The one closest to the RAM is for the CPU fan header. And we've already got a double fan splitter cable plugged into the two fans at the top of the case at the back. So we'll make a start with a pump cable. We're gonna bring it through. It's a three pin connector. Line it up. And then we'll just route the excess cable around the top and out the back. So at the back of the case, we've got this four pin fan connector, which we're gonna to need to plug into our CPU fan header. It's a double splitter cable. The two fans in the IO are all pre-installed into it. So I'm just gonna route this cable through to the front. Okay, that's our cable through to the front, and we're just going to go ahead and plug it into our CPU fan header. 
Last cable to plug in is our double fan splitter cable. We've only got one chassis fan header, which is just to the right hand side of our M.2 slot. So we'll go ahead and get it plugged in. Next thing to do is some cable management. I'm going to take our PCIe cables, bring them up the right hand side of the power supply. So they're going to be in place, ready to go into our graphics card. The rest of the cables, including the tubes of the I.O., I'm going to use the original Velcro cable straps to tidy these into the bottom of the power supply. And I'm just going to use a cable tie to tidy our 24 pin cable just to the left hand side of the power supply. Next we need to go ahead and get this bracket installed onto our graphics card. So I'm going to remove two of the slot covers. We can then go ahead and slide our graphics card into the bracket and secure it into place with the two screws we removed earlier on. Okay, so our graphics card is just going to slot into here. One thing you'll notice is I have quite limited access to plug in our PCIe cables once I've installed the graphics card. So I'm just going to set it into the case gently and go ahead and get the cables plugged in. Okay, that's the cables plugged in. What I'm now going to do is line our graphics card up. Then we can go ahead and re-secure the panel using the screws we removed earlier on. Next thing to do is add the riser cable in. So I'm just going to go ahead and open the clip on the motherboard and then go ahead and line the riser cable up with the slot and push into place and then the clip has closed. Open the clip on the other end of the riser cable, line it up with our graphics card and then again push into place and again the clip has closed. Next we need to install the fans on the bottom of the case so we're going to go ahead and remove the dust filter from the bottom. Then we'll go ahead and put our slim Noctua fans on. Importantly, we're going to want these as intakes at the bottom, so the front of the fan needs to be facing down the way. Okay, we'll go ahead and turn this over and get them screwed in. And then we can go ahead and replace the dust filter. Okay, so we're now ready to put our bottom panel on. As you can see, I've got the case turned upside down, but I think it's going to be easier to put on this way. We've got our double fan splitter cable that we plugged in earlier on, and we'll go ahead and connect these fans up to it. Just before I do though, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to route the cables in through these Velcro cable straps, keeping them out of the way, and then plug them into the splitter cable. Okay, so that's the cables nicely managed. They're in with the Velcro straps, and they should be out of the way of the fans. So all we need to do is lower this panel down again. So it's going to go in slightly here. Then we can go ahead and secure the bottom panel with the screw removed earlier on. Okay, so that's the fans installed on the bottom. And as you can see, all the cables are managed nicely out of the way. So there's nothing getting in the way of the fan blades. We can now go ahead and get the panels back on. So that's our build complete. I've gone ahead and installed Windows 10 and any drivers that we're going to need. I haven't recorded these steps because of my original NR200P build guides, I used exactly the same motherboard. So the steps are going to be exactly the same as in that video, and you'll find a link to that video in the description. There's two things I want to do now. I have done some thermal testing, and I want to share the results of that with you. And then I want to share my thoughts on the NR200P Max. So starting off with our thermal testing, you can see the results on the screen with the build we put together in the video with a tempered glass side panel. It is important to say that all fans are running in their stock fan curves in the motherboard BIOS. The next thing I did was replace the tempered glass side panel with the original steel perforated panel. Doing this, both our CPU and our GPU idled one degree hotter while there was one decibel less noise at idle. During the IDA64 stability test, our maximum CPU temperature came down by one degree 
while our maximum GPU temperature came down by a whopping 6 degrees. There was no difference to the noise levels under load. So the results are fairly clear. In terms of GPU temperatures, you're much better going with the perforated steel panel than the tempered glass panel on the side. If you do really like the look of the tempered glass panel, um, it gives you an idea of how much in terms of thermal performance you're sacrificing for the looks. In terms of looks, um, I'm not a big fan of the tempered glass panel. Really all that you can see is the GPU and the AIO at the top. And actually I think the tempered glass panel doesn't look as good as the steel panel. And when you're leaving so much performance behind in terms of GPU temperatures, again for me the steel panel would be the way to go. Now the one thing I did notice was the build was actually quite noisy and I think it was the two fans at the bottom that were the culprits as I found this in my previous small form factor builds when I had to go with the slim fans. Noctua fans are very good but the slim fans are definitely noisier than the standard thickness fans. So the next thing I wanted to test was removing the two fans at the bottom and looking at the effect that had on terms of noise and temperatures. And I tested it again both with the tempered glass side panel and the perforated steel panel. So starting off with the tempered glass panel, removing the two fans at the bottom, both our CPU and our GPU idled 3 degrees hotter, while our noise levels came down by a whopping 5 decibels. During the Ida64 stability test, without the fans at the bottom, our CPU ran 4 degrees hotter, while our GPU was 1 degree hotter. Again, noise levels came down by 5 decibels under load. Moving on to the mesh panel, again removing the two fans at the bottom didn't make any difference to our temperatures at idle, but our noise levels came down by 4 decibels. During the IDA64 stability test, our CPU ran 2 degrees hotter without the fans at the bottom, while our GPU was actually 1 degree cooler. Again, there was a noise saving of 4 decibels with removing the fans at the bottom. So the results here are fairly clear. It was the two fans at the bottom that were causing the excessive noise, and removing them our noise levels came down by 4 and 5 decibels, and the PC was definitely much more comfortable to sit beside. And without those two noisy fans at the bottom, I was actually fairly happy with the noise this PC was putting out, both at idle and under load. What was really interesting in terms of the thermals was that removing the two fans at the bottom didn't really make that much difference in terms of temperatures with the perforated steel panel, while with the tempered glass panel the temperatures increased significantly. So my advice to you would be if you do want to go with the tempered glass panel, you're going to have to go with two fans at the bottom. Those two fans are going to come at an extra cost, both financially because Noctua fans aren't cheap, and as well the extra cost is going to come in terms of noise, and it is a significant increase in noise. So factoring all that in, my preferred build in this system would be to use the perforated steel panel, which is going to mean you're not going to need to put fans at the bottom, and I actually think it looks better with the perforated steel panel than the tempered glass panel and the PC is going to be quieter and cost you less money. So that would be my preferred configuration in this case. So now it's time for me to share my thoughts on the NR200P Max. And in general, I've been really happy with this case. I find building in it very straightforward. Um, Killer Master have done a great job in simplifying the process for you. Having the power supply installed with the cables routed appropriately, the um, cable going to provide additional power to the CPU, cable tied all the way to the top left hand side of the motherboard, and cable managing the other cables was really straightforward as well. Having the AIO mostly installed was a great idea too, and this was much simpler to build in than the original NR200P. Doing it in this case, was a little bit more tricky because I would normally recommend getting all the case cables plugged in before installing the AIO. So things were a little bit tighter, particularly for plugging in the 8-pin EPS cable at the top and getting some of our fan cables plugged in over to the right-hand side of the motherboard because the AIO did definitely limit your space for doing it. But that's a small price to pay to have it pre-installed for you. Um, the only side thing I didn't like about the case was this is now a premium case with a premium price. You're getting a Gen 4 GPU riser cable, you're getting an 850 watt gold power supply and a good quality 280mm AIO. 
So for a case at this price, although given the price is going mostly towards the extra components in the case and not the case itself, the one thing lacking for me was a front panel type C connector. And that was the only th criticism really that I can make of this case. I think if you are somebody who already has a lot of the components you're going to need, you've already got an AIO, you've already got um, a good quality SFX power supply, you're probably better going with the original NR200P because again, you're paying extra money for parts you already have. If you're somebody starting out from scratch and you don't currently own any parts that you're gonna need for building in this case, buying them together in this package you're getting incredibly good value for money. You're simplifying the build process and I can most definitely recommend it. So hopefully you find the video useful. If you have, please remember to give it a thumbs up. And if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button as well. Thanks for watching.